All right, everybody, now we're going to get into uh, another form of metabolism. Again, guys, big picture here. I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. The intensity at which we're doing an activity is going to help our body decipher which of these systems it's going to use. If we're doing something that's very, very high intensity, then it needs to use a system that produces ATP very, very quickly, right? However, if we're doing something at a very low intensity, then it's going to use a system that produces ATP much uh, more slowly, okay? Um, so remember that intensity is the main uh, determining factor of which of these different metabolic systems our body is going to use, okay? Now, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the presence of oxygen uh, because now we're really getting into uh, aerobic metabolism. So, uh, the, the presence of oxygen um, is going to have a big role in all of these systems, okay? And, and that ties in with intensity, right? Because if we're working at such a high intensity that our body is not able to get enough oxygen in, well, that presence of oxygen is going to be the deciding factor um, of, of which system our body uses. So uh, what, the way I want you to think about it is this, okay? The presence of oxygen is going to be uh, depicted by the intensity at which we're working. Intensity is so high, we're not getting enough oxygen in, okay? Well, the presence of oxygen is really the, uh, it's, it's, it's the indicator to our body um, of the intensity at which we're working, okay? So our body uses the presence of oxygen as, as you know, helping it to understand, okay, which of these systems am I gonna use? If oxygen is present, we're not working at such a high intensity at that individual muscle cell, um, then it is that tells it that it can use aerobic glycolysis or fat oxidation or protein oxidation. Okay, it can use one of the oxidative systems. However, if fat or excuse me, if oxygen is not present, then that means that we're working at a very high intensity, right? And our body is going to use one of the anaerobic systems. So kind of just understand how oxygen uh, ties in with intensity and how our body perceives um, how our body perceives in intensity and and really just how it gets these different signals to uh, respond in a very specific way. So again, just to just to recap, um, low intensity activities means we have plenty of oxygen available, so our body is going to use one of the aerobic oxidative systems. High intensity activities means we don't have sufficient oxygen available at that muscle cell. Um, so it's going to use one of the uh, anaerobic uh, options for metabolism. All right, so we've talked about the ATP PCR system, also called the phosphagen system. And we've also talked about anaerobic glycolysis. Remember, when we discussed anaerobic glycolysis, we didn't have sufficient oxygen available. Um, so what happens is the pyruvate that we created in glycolysis then got converted into lactate and therefore lactic acid. Okay, but what happens now when we're not working at that incredibly high intensity and we do have sufficient oxygen available? Well, that's what we're going to get into today. Let's get started. Okay, so the first few slides of this presentation are just to simply make sure you understand uh, you're comfortable with where in the cell all of these things are occurring and, and you understand exactly what's happening. So uh, up until this point, I've explained to you uh, what uh, metabolic system our body uses during high intensity activities. Well, now we're kind of transitioning into intensities that are slightly lower in intensity. So the area in which we've been discussing uh, previously uh, is the cytoplasm that you see here, okay? So uh, if we're talking about the ATP-PCR system or uh, anaerobic glycolysis, that is occurring in the cytoplasm of the cell, okay? We have not uh, been able to get into the mitochondria yet because we need to have sufficient oxygen available in order to actually use the mitochondria that you see here, okay? Well, before, again, talking about those anaerobic mechanisms, mitochondria wasn't uh, part of the plan, therefore we're just in the cytoplasm. But now uh, that we are talking about uh, the aerobic energy systems, those that do use oxygen um, or do require oxygen and it is available, now we're actually going to get into the mitochondria so we can use that to make even more ATP um, now compared to when we were using an anaerobic system. 
So uh, I, I'll give you some overview slides, but again, big picture. So before we were in the cytoplasm, now we're working our way to utilizing the mitochondria. When you look at this slide here, uh, I, I, I hope this reminds you of anaerobic glycolysis, right? Of, of glycolysis. It's, it's not necessarily just anaerobic glycolysis. Uh, but good news is there are three main steps to aerobic glycolysis. And the first of those steps is glycolysis. And you've already seen that before, right? You've already learned about glycolysis. So nothing is different here. You have the, the first three steps, um, and then you have the remaining steps that go into the six. So nothing is different here, okay? The only difference with anaerobic and aerobic glycolysis is that now, instead of the pyruvate being converted into lactic acid, as it did with anaerobic glycolysis, now that pyruvate is being shuttled further on. Okay, so it's not just stopping here, because remember, pyruvate has one of two fates. It's either going to get converted into lactate if we don't have sufficient oxygen available. Okay, if that were the case, we would be discussing fast or anaerobic glycolysis. However, uh, the other fate is pyruvate gets pushed into the matrix of the mitochondria. All right, so that's what we're talking about here. All right, guys, so just... This is, these are areas where students can kind of get confused. So again, we've talked about um, the ATP-PCR system and we've talked about uh, aerobic, uh, sorry, anaerobic glycolysis or also called fast glycolysis. So those are the two systems we've discussed. But now we're talking about a different system. And even though uh, aerobic glycolysis and anaerobic glycolysis um, look differently, they both uh, start with glycolysis, this step here, everything that you see in front of you. If that doesn't make sense, please reach out to me. I want to make sure you guys are comfortable with this content. All right, so now let's say that instead of the pyruvate being converted into to lactate, now we do have sufficient oxygen available because we're not working at such a high intensity. The pyruvate can actually get pushed into the, the mitochondria. This is what the mitochondria looks like. Okay, so uh, the mitochondria, it's important to understand that the mitochondria has two different membranes. You can see here in red, it has the outer membrane. And you can see here in yellow that it has the inner membrane. And just beyond that inner membrane is this blue area uh, that is called the matrix of the mitochondria. So when, I'll kind of bring you back here. When we're out into the cytoplasm of the cell, okay, we're just kind of floating around out here in this area, okay? But what we want to do is get the, those uh, molecules, those pyruvates, from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria, okay? So when you look here, it actually has to go. You can just kind of picture that this white area is pink if you want to look at the, you know, compare it to the cell picture we were just referring to. But... We have to get those uh, pyruvates, those two pyruvates we just produced, we need to get them through the outer membrane of the mitochondria, then through the inner membrane of the mitochondria, then we're going to get it into the matrix. Okay, so uh, once we get it into the matrix of the mitochondria, then we can really get, uh, we can really extrapolate a lot of ATP from uh, those molecules. Okay, now I hope that you have a good, uh, good uh, grasp on kind of where we're at, and I've, I've done a good job of setting the stage of what we're talking about. Um, this slide right here is giving you an overview of aerobic, or also called slow, glycolysis. Okay, so you can see here that this is a three-step, uh, a three-stage process, I should say. It's a lot more than just three steps, but it is a three-stage process. And the first of those stages is glycolysis, right? So uh, we've already talked about glycolysis, okay, when we discussed fast glycolysis or anaerobic glycolysis. Um, with anaerobic glycolysis, we produced those two pyruvate, and those type pyruvate stayed right in the cytos or sorry, they stayed right in glycolysis or the uh, cytosol of the cell, and they were converted into lactate. However, let's say that we're working at a lower intensity 
and we have sufficient oxygen available. Well, if that is the case, then instead of those pyruvate getting converted into lactic acid here, okay, just like we showed up here, okay, well, now those pyruvate are going to get into the matrix of the mitochondria and uh, be pushed into what is called the Krebs cycle, okay? And we're going to talk about each of these in, in quite a bit more detail. But uh, once it gets into the Krebs cycle, it gets converted into uh, something. We'll talk about that. And uh, those molecules that it gets converted into are going to be pushed around this cycle, and it's going to be broken up. And from that, we're going to um, take away these high-energy carrying compounds. All of these things that get removed from those molecules are then sent to, over here, are then sent to the electron transport chain, which is the third stage of aerobic glycolysis. So again, just to really put this all together, when we're talking about anaerobic glycolysis, we just have this stage here, glycolysis. Okay. However, when we're discussing aerobic glycolysis, now we're talking about three stages. That is stage number one, glycolysis, stage number two, the Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle, and stage number three, the electron transport chain. So uh, you can see that we're now taking a lot more steps. However, because we're taking all of these extra steps, we're able to create more ATP. But on the other side of that, that means this takes more time. But if we're using a lower uh, intensity energy system, we have that time available. So you guys can just, uh, what I'd like you to do is just kind of imagine, you know, you running, uh, let's say that you're in a situation uh, where you have to run through the woods. Uh, maybe you, gotta, you have to get away from something really, really quickly. Well, when, uh, when you start, let's just say it's a bear, for example. Let's say that you, you're in the woods, you see a bear. And as soon as you see that bear, you start sprinting as hard as you can. Well, in the first, you know, somewhere between 3 to 15 seconds of that sprint, uh, you are going to utilize your HPPCR system, right? However, eventually that system runs out, okay? Well, once that system runs out, then you're going to be forced to uh, switch to this system here, which is anaerobic glycolysis, okay? So you're able to utilize anaerobic glycolysis in a relatively short amount of time. You're able to produce, you know, uh, 3 ATP if you start with glycogen or 2 ATP if you start with glucose. However, this system produces an acid as a byproduct, right? So we can only produce acids for so long before we become fatigued. Well, once you feel that burning sensation, um, eventually you're going to have to slow down, right? And when you slow down, that allows for more oxygen to get into your cells, uh, which is going to mean we have more oxygen present. So we're going to get those pyruvate to instead be converted to lactic acid uh, to, uh, from uh, being converted originally into lactic acid to now being converted into uh, or pushed into uh, the uh, mitochondria. Okay, so we're able to get a lot more energy from it, but you can see here that that's going to take a lot more time. All right, so I just want to make sure everyone really understands how our body transitions from one to another. So when you uh, slow down from using that anaerobic metabolism, uh, that's going to force you to slow down a little bit, but when you do, you're resting, you're recovering, that allows your body to produce more ATP and get more oxygen into the cell. Okay, so uh, again, just hopefully you understood that, uh, that quick overview. Now we're going to get into more detail on uh, the process of aerobic glycolysis, okay? So just to make sure everyone is aware of what we're looking at here, um, this is a diagram that I made to kind of help explain this. So just to set the stage, what you're looking at is this area right here, I've, I've labeled it here as the cytosol. Okay, so this little black rectangle that you're looking at here is the cytosol. This area here is the mitochondrial membrane. This would, to be specific, this would be the outer, the one that I'm pointing at with my mouse, would be the outer membrane, and this one would be the inner membrane, because remember, it's double-walled, just like we talked about, okay? And this area that I've labeled here is the mitochondrial matrix, all right? 
So uh, this would, you know, if you think about the uh, mitochondria that I just showed you a little while ago, this would have been the blue area, all right? So now we're talking about aerobic glycolysis. So the first steps of aerobic glycolysis are um, our glycolysis, right? So let's say that we're starting with a glucose molecule. Well, that glucose molecule goes through glycolysis and it produces, just like we said previously, this is nothing new, two ATP and two NADHs, okay? You also might remember that that one glucose molecule will produce two pyruvate. Well, once we get those pyruvate and we have sufficient oxygen available, then what's going to happen is those two pyruvate are going to move through what is called the PDH complex. Because again, remember, pyruvate has one of two fates. It's either going to uh, be converted into lactic acid or it is going to be pushed into the uh, matrix of the mitochondria. And the only way it can get into the matrix of the mitochondria is through this thing right here uh, called the PDH complex. Now, the PDH stands for, uh, just in case you care, uh, some, some uh, students do like to know, uh, it stands for pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So this is a complex of enzymes that will allow that pyruvate to get in through both of those uh, mitochondrial membranes, the outer and the inner, and will allow it to get pushed in through uh, the uh, matrix of the mitochondria. When it does go through the PDH complex, we have created two more NADHs. Okay, so remember, NADHs are those high energy carrying compounds. And when we produce those, they go to what's called the electron transport chain. Once the pyruvate go through the PDH complex and create those NADHs, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA. Okay, make sure you guys, uh, you know, you can, you can follow along with this process. It really helps you to teach someone else um, using these slides exactly what's happening here just to make sure that you really understand. But remember, each pyruvate that goes through that PDH complex will create one acetyl-CoA. If we have two pyruvates, that gives us two acetyl-CoA, okay? And that, the acetyl-CoA, is what really will start the Krebs cycle. Now, uh, our body works through what's called negative feedback, all right? And we've talked about this already as well. But what happens at the end of a system will uh, dictate what is what is going to happen at the beginning of it. You might remember the analogy that I gave you uh, of, of the factory, okay? Let's say that, you know, um, you know uh, with the analogy of the factory, uh, let's say that we're, we have a, a teddy bear factory. I think that's one thing that a class used previously. Um, we have a, a factory that makes teddy bears. Well, if we have a lot of demand, then uh, we're going to have a lot of supply, right? We're going to be making teddy bears very, very, very quickly. Um, however, if we have a bunch of teddy bears that are, uh, that are stockpiling at the end of the line because demand is now all of a sudden low, well, that's going to make us slow down our production, right? And your body works in much the same way. So if you have a high energy need, aka demand is high, then we're going to use systems that produce a lot of energy or ATP. However, if demand is low, then we're going to use the systems that very slowly produce the energy. I hope that analogy makes sense still. Um, so again, back to this whole idea of negative feedback, well, we have a variety of things that will uh, tell the PDH complex whether or not it should let that pyruvate in or if it should close its doors and force pyruvate to be converted into uh, lactate or lactic acid, okay? So some things that will inactivate this PDH complex or shut it down, okay? Again, you can kind of think of the PDH complex as a gate. It will either let pyruvate in or not. If we have a lot of ATP that's been produced and stored, then uh, that will shut the PDH complex down. All right, we don't need a, a bunch more ATP, therefore it will shut it down. Um, also, if we have a, an accumulation of NADHs, if the NADHs aren't going anywhere, 
then that will also uh, shut the, the PDH complex down. And, and I'll, help, I'll help you all understand this uh, in another, um, another graphic later on as well. Uh, in addition, if we have an accumulation of acetyl-CoA's, they're just kind of stockpiling, they're building up and not going anywhere, then that will also tell the PDH complex to shut down. Okay, so we have all of these things that will kind of direct this to whether or not it should open its gates or close its gates. All right. Now, we also have things that will tell this to this PDH complex to open and allow pyruvate to be converted into acetyl-CoA. One of those things is an increase uh, in accumulation of calcium. Okay, uh, you're going to find out later in the muscle structure and function slide that uh, calcium is a major molecule when it comes to muscular contractions. If we have a lot of calcium uh, that's being utilized, that is going to tell the PDH complex to open and allow pyruvate in. Um, another one is uh, an, an accumulation of pyruvate. So if we're producing a lot of pyruvates, uh, the body is going to want those to go somewhere. So that will uh, convert or push them through the PDH complex. And another one is a, an accumulation of insulin. Uh, you may or may not know this, but insulin is a hormone um, that, uh, that allows sugar to get pushed into the muscle cell so we can use it for energy. If we have a lot of insulin uh, that is surrounding that cell, then that is going to open up the PDH complex and it will get pyruvate into it. So again, guys, just to make sure you're not confused, uh, we have these different mechanisms that will tell the PDH complex what to do. The, the body is constantly working on signaling mechanisms. It doesn't just kind of internally make a decision to do something. It, it does, it, it changes its function based on what's happening um, in, in the system. Okay, it has all these different mechanisms that will signal it and tell it what to do. So these are just a couple of them. I hope you're able to follow me right now. So, so at this point, we've gotten into the matrix of the mitochondria, and we have these two molecules called acetyl-CoA. Now, once we are here at acetyl-CoA, okay, this is a, a uh, kind of a, a closer look at the Krebs cycle, just to make sure you're all aware. Um, so we talked about this previously, all right? So again, I, I know I have a lot of different slides, but they often kind of touch on one another just to make sure you guys understand how, how they connect. Um, so we had our pyruvate from glycolysis. That pyruvate went through the PDH complex, which you can just imagine is lying right here. And that one pyruvate created one NADH. However, if we start with one glucose molecule, that creates two pyruvate. So therefore, we would have two NADHs and two acetyl-CoA's, all right, just from one glucose molecule. All right, so once we have those acetyl-CoA's, there is something that has to happen in order for the Krebs cycle to initiate its cycle, okay, to know how to start. Well, what happens is that acetyl-CoA has to mix with the molecule oxaloacetate that you see right here in order to make citrate, all right? It is the combination of acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate that makes citrate, and these are the main things that will enable the Krebs cycle to begin its cycle, all right? So this is something that I definitely want you to write in your notes, all right? The whole point of the Krebs cycle is to make high energy carrying compounds, all right? Again, the entire point of the Krebs cycle is to make high energy carrying compounds. And it does this by mixing the acetyl-CoA with the oxaloacetate, making citrate, and that will jumpstart this whole cycle, all right? And when, when those things happen, we can kind of follow along with this, uh, they make a lot of those high energy carrying compounds. Now, uh, believe me, I know a lot of my dietetic students had to memorize this Krebs cycle step by step by step. I don't need you to know that. You don't need to remember um, fumarase or succinate dehydrogenase or succinyl coa synthase. It, you don't have to memorize those things. I want you to understand what's happening here 
not exactly every step of it and memorizing things. And then really, ultimately, you still don't really understand what the Krebs cycle does. Okay. Um, so the, the point of the Krebs cycle is to make high energy carrying compounds. And you can see that it, it does this. Okay. So one acetyl CoA, when it goes through this, creates how many NADHs? Well, we can kind of go through and count. It creates one, two, three NADHs. It also creates one FADH. And it also creates one ATP. Okay, so uh, I strongly recommend that you write those things in your notes. One uh, cycle of Krebs creates three NADHs, one FADH, and one ATP. So how many of each of those things would we get if we started with one glucose molecule? Well, you might remember that one glucose molecule creates two pyruvate. Two pyruvate will create two acetyl-CoA. If we have two acetyl-CoA, then that means that we have two turns of Krebs. If we have two turns of Krebs, then that means that we're creating six NADH, right? Because one turn creates three. If we have two turns of Krebs, that means we have six NADHs, two FADHs, and two ATP. Okay, so um, again, all of those things are going to be sent on to the electron transport chain. All right, so uh, just to remind you, NADHs, okay, are high energy carrying compounds. So are FADHs, okay? Now, what I want you to do in your notes is write this. One NADH equals 2.5 ATP. One FADH equals 1.5 ATP. Okay, so it's not merely the presence of NADHs and FADHs that we automatically get ATP from. It's actually those uh, high energy carrying compounds that will be sent to the electron transport chain. And once they're in the electron transport chain, then we get a lot of ATP from them. And the reason why I just had you write down what you did is because each NADH that goes through the electron transport chain, that will eventually give us 2.5 ATP, and each FADH will eventually give us 1.5 ATP. When we're creating a lot of those in the Krebs cycle, you can see that we can get a lot of ATP uh, just off of that one glucose molecule that we started with. I hope that makes sense. If not, please ask. Do you all remember how glycolysis or fast glycolysis had its rate limiting enzyme? Well, that enzyme was called PFK. Remember, that is the enzyme that decides how slowly or how quickly this system will operate. So glycolysis has this specific enzyme, okay? That was PFK, just as a reminder. Well, the Krebs cycle, also has its own specific enzyme as well that is considered the rate limiting enzyme and that is called isocitrate dehydrogenase. And what's interesting about these enzymes is that as we use different systems, they will upregulate to make the system more efficient and, and work faster, okay? So uh, think about, uh, think about the, the type of exercise you do. If we do a lot of aerobic exercise, like uh, of jogging or swimming or cycling, okay, well, we're going to be relying on this Krebs cycle quite heavily. Well, as an adaptation to that, what's going to happen is we are going to produce more and use more isocitrate dehydrogenase. And conversely, let's say that you, use a, uh, you exercise a lot in a way that uses glycolysis a lot. Okay, it uses anaerobic glycolysis, so you exercise with very, very high intensity. Well, if that's the case, then this uh, enzyme, PFK, is going to upregulate, and uh, it's going to allow glycolysis to work much faster. So, um, you know, you'll be able to get through uh, those, those glucose and glycogen molecules much faster anaerobically, 
or if you do a lot of aerobic training, then um, the Krebs cycle's uh, rate-limiting enzyme is going to upregulate, again, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and uh, you're going to go through this system very quickly. So it really just depends on what type of, of exercise you do, but that's just one of the many ways in which your body will adapt uh, and become much more efficient. Um, I, I, what I will say at this point too, and I tell uh, every student this, when you guys are learning these things, I highly recommend that you don't just write them down and read them or look at them on a slide. I want you to get used to saying them out loud, okay? Some of this information is a lot like learning a new language. If you don't say the words out loud, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to remember uh, how to um, say them or remember them at all when it comes to being in a test-taking situation. Um, so the more times you can say words like acetyl-CoA or oxaloacetate or isocitrate dehydrogenase, the more times you say them, the more comfortable you're going to get with them, the more easily you're going to be able to memorize them and, and uh, more comfortably explain what's happening in each slide. Okay, so now we're getting into uh, the, the next part of this. So remember, aerobic glyc uh, glycolysis has three different stages. We've already discussed glycolysis. We've already discussed the Krebs cycle. And now we're going to discuss the electron transport chain over here. Okay, let me get my little pointer thing. Okay. So this is the electron transport chain. So we just made, we had all those processes. We made those NADHs, we made those FADHs. Then we send them to this structure here called the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain sits on the inner mitochondrial membrane. You might remember that when I showed you this, this yellow part here was that inner membrane. Okay, well, all of those things that we just produced were produced in the matrix of the mitochondria. And that's shown in this section here. I know there's a lot going on in this, but we're gonna take it slow so I can help you understand what's occurring, okay? Well, when we produce all those things in the matrix, they go to this electron transport chain or this series of proteins, all right? Well, all of the NADHs and FADHs that we produced will go to this area. And you can see here, I want you to just kind of look right here at FADH, uh, uh, sorry, NADH, and also at FADH, okay? Well, you can see that they are, um, you have NADH plus a hydrogen, and then once it goes by this protein here, it becomes NAD. So if we have NAD and two H's, and then all of a sudden we lose the two H's, we're just left with NAD, right? So what happens is, those NADHs uh, will drop off their hydrogens, okay? And hydrogen molecules uh, are, are uh, very interesting because they're actually composed of protons and electrons. And what happens is those electrons uh, will stay right here on this inner mitochondrial membrane, so this becomes very negatively charged and all of the positively charged protons will get pushed out into this outer mitochondrial area, all right? So you have this area right here being very positively charged, and this area right here being very negatively charged. Well, what this does is this sets us up very well uh, for a, a reaction, okay? When you have, just like in a battery, when you have positives mixing with negatives, that produces energy. So right here you have all these NADHs and FADHs and additional hydrogens that are being pumped out into the outer mitochondrial membrane, and the electrons that were attached to those stay right here. So you have all of these protons, uh, positive environment, all of these negative electrons right here, and on the uh, as part of the electron transport chain, you have this protein here that I'm circling, encircling, um, called the ATP synthase, all right? ATP synthase uh, can really essentially be seen as the battery of the electron transport chain. That allows the hydrogens, the positive hydrogens, to mix with this very negatively uh, energized area, 
Um, and what that does is that uh, will help create energy, okay? So that energy, uh, if, if you can remember when we talked about the production of ATP, you might remember that we have to have a phosphate join to ADP, uh, creating ATP. Well, this ATP synthase gives us that energy to create the high energy carrying bonds, and that will bind these phosphates to our ADPs that we have, and that creates ATP, all right? Um, and unless we have the presence of oxygen in this system, none of that will be able to work. Uh, I, I hope that that kind of makes sense. You don't have to know, um, you know, all of these different mechanisms here. You just need to know that the high energy carrying compounds will go to the electron transport chain um, and they will get kicked out. And when they get kicked out, they separate into protons and electrons. Those protons and electrons uh, will eventually mix in ATP synthase, providing the energy that we need to combine our phosphates to our ADPs, creating a lot of ATP, okay? Um, I have a little video here that kind of puts all this uh, in motion to really help you understand the process of the electron transport chain. During glycolysis and the tricarboxylic acid cycle, Oxidation of organic molecules results in production of reduced coenzymes such as NADH. These coenzymes transfer hydrogens to the electron transport chain, which is located in the bacterial cell membrane. A hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron. The electron transport chain consists of a series of special electron carrier proteins that shuttle electrons from NADH to a terminal electron acceptor, such as oxygen. Electrons enter the electron transport chain when NADH transfers its protons plus electrons to a membrane-embedded carrier protein. The electrons are sequentially carried along the electron transport chain while the protons are shuttled to the outside of the membrane. Some of the electron carriers, such as coenzyme Q, accept a proton from the inside of the cell membrane as it accepts electrons. The proton is then transported through the membrane as electrons move down the chain. This increases the proton gradient across the membrane and enhances the proton motive force. During aerobic respiration, the last carrier protein transfers a pair of electrons to oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain, and water is formed. The enzyme ATP synthase utilizes the energy of the proton motive force to synthesize ATP. This enzyme allows protons to pass back into the cell and couples the energy released in this process to the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP. All right, that is aerobic glycolysis. I hope that uh, makes pretty good sense to you. Um, if not, I want you to rewatch that until you really uh, do feel comfortable and confident explaining and understanding the material. If not, you need to ask me. Uh, that's what my office hours are for. Uh, that's why I'm always open and willing to meet. I know these things can be complex, uh, but uh, you will only understand it if you make the effort and come talk to me if you don't understand it. Um, now, before we meet next time, I have a little bit of homework for you. I'd like you to uh, try to figure something out for me, all right? I want you to do a calculation of how many ATP we will get if we start with one glucose molecule that goes through the entire process of aerobic glycolysis, okay? We have one glucose molecule that goes through aerobic glycolysis. How many ATP do we get from that? Now, the things you should be thinking about are how many ATP are produced specifically right then and there, also how many NADHs are produced and where, and how many FADHs are produced, okay? I want you to uh, get some pen and paper, write those things down, and I want you to give this a shot before we meet next time. 
All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. Please reach out to me if you have any questions at all. And I'm really looking forward to uh, working with you uh, and understanding metabolism um, and, and, and uh, just having a better uh, grasp on, on this content. I think a lot of students often have learned about these, uh, these different uh, processes and silos, but they don't really truly understand how it all works together. And I want to make sure that you do. Um, Next time uh, we meet, uh, we're going to be having a quiz. So make sure that uh, you, you finish the rest of this talk and uh, you are prepared for that quiz. I will send you more information on Canvas regarding the quiz, and I hope you have a good day. Take care.